So it seems like almost every day, someone shares an article with me that says, will robots steal our jobs? But what upsets me about such features is not just how limited they are in their understanding of the problem, but also in their imagination of the potential outcomes. You see, where they get stuck is they only see the future through the lens of today. And what I mean is that in these stories, the ideal of full employment economics remains the same. That in a healthy society and in a healthy economy, everyone should have the chance and perhaps even the duty to get a job. They therefore present the question to us in such a way as to mobilize our fear. Fear of being stuck in a dead-end career or fear of being unemployed. But what they don't do is acknowledge the greater fear the fear that the future might look very different to today. And you see, here's the bit that's really scary. In the future, full employment might not be likely or even possible. You see that robotics, automation software, and artificial intelligence together are driving the robot revolution. And the idea of revolutions is scary. But this is our chance to design the future that we want to have. And I believe it's not just those of us who work in the tech industry who should have a say in designing this future. This is a conversation we all should have the chance to play a part in. And in order to have a meaningful conversation, we need to be aware of the issues. We need to be aware of the full facts. And that's what I've made my mission to try and do. I spent the past few years working for one of the largest organizations in the world and helping them evaluate and implement this technology. And now I'm going to share with you everything I've learned. You see, in the past, we built machines that could do superhuman things, machines that could move more than a person, like a bulldozer, or machines that could recall information faster, like a database or search engine or machines that could follow rules millions of times without getting distracted, like those um, annoying telephone menu systems. But what's different about the technology we're building today is we're building machines with our very skills and abilities. Robots are being given dexterity, things that you and I take for granted, like the ability to turn the handle of a door, open and walk through it, will soon be something that a machine can also achieve. Artificial intelligence techniques can succeed in tasks that require a high level of pattern recognition skill, such as seeing who or what is in a picture. And albeit in very narrow instances, they can even reach levels of accuracy much greater than human experts. And whereas in the past, rule-based systems grew so complex that progress ground to a halt, the latest automation software can literally see cursor movements, mouse clicks, and keyboard entries, and not just predict what it is that the user is going to do, but do it for them. So remember, three branches of tech research and the breakthroughs that are happening in each, robotics, automation, and AI, is the replication of human abilities in machines. Now, some cynics will argue that in the past, we've always created new jobs for those displaced through automation. And that has been true until now. But remember, what we've largely been doing with technology is inventing machines with superhuman skills and then allocating labor to those jobs which require human talent or human touch. And given that now we are building machines, that have human abilities, in the future we will only be left with those jobs that specifically require human touch. And this isn't Star Trek. This is happening silently all around us. You remember those um, voice recognition systems just a few years ago? I remember testing transcription software. It was so laughably bad. It was quicker for me to type. And the story was the same for a friend of mine. She's a radio producer, and she would give her interns the interviews to transcribe. Until recently, because now it can be done cheaper, 
faster, and just about as accurately by machine. You see, the world is changing around us faster than we care to believe. But the day this becomes a problem is not the day where half the population are unemployed through automation, and not 10% or 1%. It's the day the first child comes through high school and sits with their career counselor, who says, "I'm sorry, there is just nothing that you can do of economic value that a machine can't do just as well." What I'm talking about here, it's not unemployment in the 19th or 20th century sense. This is unemployability. And I believe there are three steps to surviving this robot revolution. And the first one is to acknowledge the extent and speed of change, and that it is likely to create unemployability. So, what do we do next? Well, we need to reimagine the economics. How do we support those who who are left unemployed through automation? Well, one solution that has often been put forward is that of universal basic income, or UBI, and this is essentially a pension for all, with the intention that by paying an amount to everyone sufficient to ensure they can survive, the need for getting a job is taken away. People are then free to choose the futures that they want based on their skills and ambitions, and that cliche of Great artists wasting their talent by waiting tables will be no more. So UBI is a potential solution. It has one great strength: it helps people make the distinction between jobs and work. You see, work is anything that you do with intention, whereas a job is the work that you do with the intention of being paid. And many of us. We've lost sight of the fact that there are so many people who make incredible contributions to society, but not through their jobs. Anyone who has cared for a relative, raised a child, or supported a charity will know that these things are hard work, and they are not jobs. If we could only remove the stigma of joblessness. How many more people would be free to work on things, which would also make great contributions to the world? Now, these might seem like noble ideals, but UBI is only successful in eliminating the bureaucracy from the benefit system, and will only ever function under full employment economics. You see, when unemployability strikes, UBI runs the risk of creating permanent landlord. And tenant classes. It'll be the rich compensating the poor for remaining poor, a form of techno feudalism, where those who have and who have not will simply be a game of musical chairs. And who will own the machines when the music stops? To be sure, distribution of ownership is a challenge which we are going to need to address. But for now, I just want to imagine how our economy might look if we were to make just one small change in our thinking. So, rather than worrying about robots stealing our jobs, what if we were to proactively automate labour out of those industries that were essential for our survival? If you eliminated Human labour, from the equation of any particular product or service, it would become free. In the past, we were faced with scarcity, but imagine an abundant economy. What little cost that remains would be eliminated by the market and by competition. If we could make those industries that were essential for our survival. Ones with a minimum of human labour, we would not need a universal basic income, but we would achieve the same goal: the products and services that we all need to survive could be provided through automation, and we would all be free. Now, 
I'd like to take this one step further. And by way of example, consider the production and distribution of food, which, as you know, has already been hugely mechanized, and so much so that a very small number of people can today create enough food to feed us all. And that's a fact. We can grow enough food to feed the entire world's population. But we don't because of money. While the proportion of income we spend on feeding our families has shrunk to its lowest level across the entire population, there are, there are still those who are so poorly nourished, they are no better off than their ancestors were centuries ago. And I'm not just talking here about people who live in developing countries, I'm talking about people who live amongst us. A recent study found that one in six American households suffer from low food security. And here in the UK, it was estimated that half a million people found cause to resort to food banks just to survive. It doesn't have to be this way. We can grow enough food. The problem is, and always will be, cost. With automation, we could all have enough to be fed and healthy. You see, the problem is that modern farming methods require a high degree of homogeny. Fields, they're rectangular and large. A single field contains a single crop, because that is easier to manage. They are sown on the same day, and they are harvested on the same day, because that is easier to manage. And such high concentrations of single crops, they skew the ecosystem and attract unnatural levels of pests. And these are dealt with by unnatural levels of pesticide. We then leave our fields fallow one year and seven to recover. And then the onslaught resumes. The result is efficient, but unnatural. And the story for the animals who provide our food is yet bleaker than for our crops. But it was not always like this. If we step back in history, we see the American, the, the um, Native Americans, they believed in this concept called the Three Sisters, which were corn, beans, and squash. You see, they planted them together because they supported each other's development. And there was also recognition in that culture for finding a balance between nourishing the population and the ecosystem that they relied on. And back further, we hunted what we could and gathered the rest. Nature dictated what or how much could be grown. Species were left to diversify, but no inch of the soil was not green. We learned to farm, not because there wasn't enough food, but to suit our tastes and to give better predictability to our existence. Farming then became necessary for the elite to be free, and while the masses burdened, we then mechanized it to free many more of the masses. But if we were to fully automate it, we could all be free. I'd like you to just close your eyes for one moment. And I'd like you to picture a world full of small autonomous drones, which could hunt and gather for us using technology we already have today. Using machine vision, they could see when it's time to sow or when to reap. Using robot dexterity to plow or to harvest. Interconnected with an array of sensors and other devices that together would balance the needs of people with the needs of our planet. And you see that plants and animals that have been separated for millennia could once again be reintroduced together. Machines would simply take what the market predicts we want and when we need it. Just-in-time delivery, like Toyota's assembly line, but for food instead. Could you see them? What's amazing is when you leave humans in the loop, we're stuck with the old way that we've been doing things. But as soon as you take people out of the production process, new possibilities suddenly emerge. And what I find fascinating is how technology could help us get back to living how the ancients lived, but at scale. 
agriculture and its agriculture has driven technology throughout human history. And the next step down that road will soon be taken with autonomous trucks driving the labor out of the supply chain. And other jobs will soon follow. But if we encourage and not resist the pace of change, particularly in essential industries, the very goods and services that we all need to survive could be provided for free. And so that takes me to the third step. And this is the hard one. While I don't believe that UBI is the answer, because it creates the risk of locking in a permanent state of inequality, I did say that I, I felt it had one great strength. It helps people make the distinction between jobs and work. And so in a world where so many of us define who we are by the jobs that we hold, it is hard to accept a future where there is a threat to that which gives us purpose. But jobs don't give us purpose, they give us income. Meaning comes from the authenticity of human touch, connection and experience. So we may deny the robots will steal our jobs because somehow our chosen profession is different. Or we may be scared of the robots and fight against the change. But underneath, what we're not acknowledging is, is that which is really scary. That to create lives of meaning and purpose in spheres outside of our jobs is hard. And so remember, there are three steps to surviving the robot revolution. The first is to acknowledge the likelihood of unemployability. And next, we can reimagine the economics, and we must if we're going to survive this shift. And the third, a wise friend once helped me see that what I needed was to weave a thread through the passions of my spare time and also into my career. And if I could do this, it would help me hold the balance between the various jobs in my life and the gaps between them. And so the third step is to find that thread and weave it through your life. In a world where you did not need a job to survive, what might you dream of doing? And what might your purpose become? Mine is to help people face their fear in technology and to start conversations about the opportunities for us if we could just get it right. I can imagine the future where none of us need go hungry again might be just around the corner. What can you imagine? Thank you.